your eyes open and you seem to return to awareness of being in a body. What if you don't hold it? What if it just passes like a shadow? This is the third part of our three-part series on the nature of the self. We started at the top with the superego, the judge, the conversation about what's wrong, what needs to be fixed, what needs correction. And then we went to the middle level of the doer, the planner, the dreamer, what Freud calls the ego. And I've been using Freud's general division of these super ego, ego, and now today we're going to examine what he called id. Id simply in German is it. So in Freud's view of the, what he calls the self, there's the judge, the doer, and it lives in the basement. In Freud's view, from his egoic fixation as a sexual sex, this it in the basement is a dark, hairy, polymorphous, perverse beast that if ever let out, would run amok. And so there's a strong need for a strong superego that stands at the basement door and keeps it shut, keeps this mess, this sexual seething in the basement. That's Freud's view. So far, I changed a little bit what the superego is, and we've looked at our nature of the doer very differently. But now let's look at it a little differently as well. It is our animal nature. In Freud's view, in those days, humans weren't really animals. Humans were something separate, something different, something beyond animal. But now we know better. We've been enlightened to the truth that we are just another primate. That we lost our tails when the, all the great apes lost their tails in a genetic mutation maybe nine million years ago. And so as a primate, as an animal, we have a certain animal nature. And this animal nature is what drives the form. These are the three drives of the animal. Every animal has these drives. First, the drive to survive. This drive to survive starts at the single cell level. Without an urge to survive, you perish. You don't eat. You don't find shelter or safety. You don't figure out where the food is. Just give up and die. So from the one cell on to us is this will to survive. That's our basic animal drive. The second animal drive that we share with all other creatures is a drive to relate, to be social, to be part of a group, part of a family, part of a tribe, part of a herd, part of a hive. That's a survival drive translated now into relationship with supposed other. And together as a team, as a tribe, as a hive, we survive. And the third animal drive is the sexual drive, the drive to create others, to pass it on, so that the DNA lives from one body to the next. So it's this genetic drive to be sexual, to pass it on, to recreate, to procreate. And so now if we look at these, the difference so far, I'd say, between the superego, the ego, and this animal drive is that the animal drives are non-reflective impulses. If you're hungry, you grab it. There's no mediation between the hunger and the grabbing. 
It's an impulse. It's non-reflective. Superego is quite reflective. It has a whole story and a judgment based on that story of what should be and what is and what's perfect and what isn't. And so it's continually reflecting itself through that story of judgment and blame. The egoic self is also reflective. Also, it's reflective through a story of itself, through who it says it is, who its relationships are, what its work is in the world, what its family is. That's a story that's created as a self-reflective device for the egoic eye. These lower drives are inherently non-self-reflective. They're impulses. And so Freud's, Freud's attempt to control them is to have a strong superego. And this is the function of the church, is to create a morality so that the animal will behave. It's socialization of the animal drives. So I'd like this to adjust for a moment. Try a little experiment. Because we're going to find that one of these drives in us is stronger than the others. And the drive that really runs our machine sets the stage for the other drives. So if self-preservation is your motivating drive, social and sexual activities and objects and people will appear in the arena of self-preservation. If, on the other hand, social is the drive, then the social milieu, the family, the tribe, the group, is where self-preservation is issues will show up, or sexual issues will show up. And if it's a sexual impulse that runs the drive, then that creates the arena so that everything is eroticized to a degree. Self-preservation, social, are all in service to the eroticized sexual impulse. And, you know, we can see the social impulse if we look at our closest relatives, chimpanzees. And you can see they live in groups. They relate. They have hierarchies. They have social relationships. They groom each other. They take care of each other. They fight with each other. They're in relationship. That's the social drive. You can see it in gorillas, our next closest relatives. The way they live in clans, families, nurturing each other, protecting each other, being in hierarchies, part of the social drive. And when the social drive gets so extreme, we see it in hives. Consider a beehive. Sex, not much of a big deal. It's just for the queen and only once a year. So sex is not running it. Self-preservation, each individual is willing to die in service of the whole. That's why a bee stinger, when a bee stings you, it dies. It's giving its life to protect the whole. That's the social drive that has primacy. Sexual drive, it's really interesting. These little anecdotal stories about the sexual drive. I saw a great experiment that was done with fruit flies where they took a fruit fly, um, took a female fruit fly, and took the segment of the DNA that was sexually encoded and spliced it in. And when this female fruit, fruit fly was released into a container with another female fruit fly, it started a courtship. It started by rubbing its wings and making a song, which is what male fruit flies do to attract females. And when this song was accepted by the female, it came closer and touched its knee, which is another signal of infinite bonding. If the knee touch is rejected, well, then it's waiting for someone else. If the knee touch is accepted, then this female fly, the male fly, then licks the genitals of the female fly. 
This was all done as if it were a male fly, because it had a little segment of DNA spliced into its genes. So, when we as humans do it, we have a whole story about it. We have a whole romantic serenade, and romantic first touching, romantic first kissing. And we have a whole drama, a romance, that gets built into it. But it's simply like a fruit fly. Another example of that is an animal creature called a vole that lives in the western United States. And these voles live in burrows in the prairie, and they also live in woodlands. And it turns out that the prairie vole is monogamous and stays and helps and raise the children. The woodland vole is not monogamous and doesn't stay around the nest once the babies are born. It leaves. Very different behaviors. And yet when they switched the sexual genetics between these two, they switched their behaviors. And the one that used to be monogamous left the nest. And the one that used to leave the nest stayed and helped raise the children. So we're wired in certain ways. And each one of us is wired with one of these drives and primacy that runs the show. And the others follow suit. The others show up in the arena of self-preservation or in the arena of sexual activity or in the arena of the family. So let's try a little experiment. We're going to try a guided meditation to discover this for ourselves. So if you would like to just take a moment to get comfortable, put down any extra objects that are in your hands, letting yourself settle in, And you might notice the body's breathing. And you might notice that by noticing it, it changes. That's a signal. But you can drop inside to an altered state from your normal waking consciousness. Your eyes can stay open or closed, it doesn't matter. But you might now become aware of a very subtle sensation deep inside. That's a signal that you're already deeper than the conscious mind knows. I don't know how it is for you to be so completely relaxed. The mind can stop. The sensations turn inward. And you find yourself falling into a deep, empty space. So just for a moment, what if in this moment you drop your sexual identity. In other words, what if in this moment no one looks at you sexually? You don't look at anyone else as a sexual object. All your sexual fantasies stop. If you pull yourself out of the sexual arena it's an experiment in this moment. For some people, this won't mean anything at all. For others, it's the core of something very deep. And maybe you're not aware when you're walking down the street of how others look at you. But in this moment, what if you stop seeing anyone as a sexual object? What if you are invisible to everyone else as a sexual object? Let that experience deepen. It's an experiment. 
to see what's left. And what if you have no social safety net? In this moment, as an experiment, what if you have no parents, no siblings, no partners, husbands, or wives, no children? Just examine where you're attached, no workers. Examine where you're connected, no friends, and let it stop for this moment. It's an experiment, completely alone, with no one to connect to, no one to relate with. And what's that experience? And now, are you willing to stop all worries about money, all discussions about money, rent, mortgage, food, all worries, all discussions, all fantasies, and all your relationships? that are based on security. You can acknowledge that they're here and let them stop in this moment. Let money stand for survival and let it disappear in this moment as an experiment. If you have nothing, That's really good. This is the place to begin, to discover who you are when it's not being run by any animal drive. Find out who are you. If you're not a sexual object or a social object or survival is not the issue. It's really good. And so now this experiment is going to change its form. This inquiry can continue. This investigation into yourself can continue. All through the day and night, till it's finally concluded in certainty. But for now, let's let body awareness return. The sense of the body's breathing. The sense of your hands and feet. A sense of being in a body. And if your eyes were closed, they can open. And you can see freshly. Without the veils. Of security, relationship, and sex. It's very good. So it's not about getting rid of these drives. They're normal. They're natural. As an animal, you have these drives. We all have them. I have them. Quite naturally. The difference is, who's running the show? To what degree is your life based on survival? To what degree is your life based on your relationships? And to what degree is it based on sex? Just examine this for yourself. There's no right or wrong. But 
the issue is to see, is there a point where you're not willing to go further because of some story around survival, relationship, or sex? Because we use a story to justify our own limitation, self-betrayal, by giving the drive the lead, letting it run the show. But when a drive runs the show, we never say, oh, that's my self-survival. That's my fear of survival. That's why I'm working here. That's why I'm in relationship with you. That's why I want this house. We always have a very elaborate story to cover it. So it's socially acceptable. It's not my fear of survival. It's because I like you. I like being around you. Makes me feel good. I like doing things for you. Makes me feel good. And so that's the story we tell ourselves. When perhaps underneath that story is the survival drive running. And perhaps if the survival drive is running, on the surface we're betraying ourselves. Maybe that's not really what I want to be doing. Maybe I don't really want to be in a relationship with you right now. Maybe if I stay true to my heart, something completely different and unknown will appear. And that's threatening. That threatens all the drives. But when the drives surrender, when even your drive to survive surrenders to yourself, to the truth of yourself, then even these drives become in service. You ride them. These are your wind horse. Padmasambhava is the first Tibetan Buddhist to speak of the wind horse. And this is what your wind horse is, your animal nature that you ride to liberation. And after liberation that you ride in freedom without being a slave to it. And sometimes it'll catch you. I've been caught. I know. But even when you're caught, it's not that you're caught by, oh, now I need to be secure. It's some elaborate story will come in to justify whatever it is that's appearing that's catching you. So that's where we have to be vigilant with ourselves. Just tell the truth to ourselves. It's not about telling the truth to anyone else. Just to ourselves, to be honest with ourselves. That's where mindfulness is. You know, people want to be mindful, but you can't be mindful by trying to be mindful. You have to find the root of mindfulness. And the root of mindfulness is no mind. If you trace mindfulness back to its root, there's no mind. And when no mind is the ground, consciously, this is mindfulness in action, quite mysteriously. But as long as there's a mind trying to be mindful, this is confusion. This is one of the drives running, unacknowledged, and being used to rationalize and justify a story to keep the egoic mind alive. Well, I hope this was useful. I'd love to hear your feedback. And I'd love to hear your questions, comments, or reports. So, let's see if anybody's... Okay, Michael. Mikey is called in. Germany. Hello, Eli. Hello, Michael. Hello. Hello, I couldn't wait to hear you. And I'm still amazed that I have the possibility to be with you here. And thank you for the topic. It's, uh, it has really to do with me. And what a relief not to follow this, um, yeah, the sexual issues and also social issues for me. And um, I, I want to tell you something about um, my world and 
when I have sex, for example, or intensive feelings, I feel my body and it feels really alive. And so the same is when I eat good uh, things or I'm in social groups. And um, a really good day is when all of those aspects come together in one day and continue the whole week, you know. So addicted to be seen from others, being heard from them, being realized from them and not to be alone. It's uh, running away from being alone and distracting me with all uh, with sex, relations, work, thinking, eating, and um, yeah, because when I'm alone, there's this emptiness and boringness. Like I need the outside to feel myself, or that I even use it not to feel my hopelessness. So mm. this week and also today, I'm really alone and can't enjoy the loneliness. There's a body tense and a pressure on my chest and I start thinking a lot of shit, judging myself, others that feel better than me or that have more in this moment like me and but I try not to think so bad and <laughs> searching some deflection and yeah. yeah. And deeply I got it that I won't find it anymore in the outside and that's very sad because I love life and body pleasures too. So it's really pity that someday all will end, but at the same time I recognize the suffering in that, you know? So here I am in this despair that scares me because it feels more and more like a depression and I'm afraid of that I will fall down and lose the joy in life. But can I ask you, um, how can I bear my loneliness without being any more a slave of my animal body, but also not to negate it, you know? It's so confusion for me. I'm not a body, but I love to be the body. I love to be sexual. I love to be an animal sometimes, you know? It's, sure. That's not the yeah. problem. There's no problem with being the animal. There's no problem with being sexual. There's no problem with enjoying life. I love to cook. I love mm -hmm. to eat. I love to garden. I love mm -hmm. making love. I love life. I you love know. this human incarnation. I do. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's about. But um, you know better because you know you're hiding from meeting yourself, from being alone. The thing is, and that's why it doesn't work for you. That's why all the pleasures, all the good eating, good sex, it feels good at the moment, but it doesn't last. There's, al there's always a hunger for more, a need for more, a need for different. And yet, as you see, you're kind of sad about losing it. You're afraid you're going to lose something. And so that's what yeah. keeps you suffering. So there's not a full willingness to really find what's beyond. And when you find what's beyond, then you actually can begin living instead of a frantic chasing and a running away from emptiness. Mm. Yeah, running away from emptiness and running away from life, you know, it's both. That's right. It's, it's, um, and it's not really enjoying. It's not, like you said, it's not really, I do all this stuff, but it's not really living. Yes. That's it. So this is wisdom speaking. So since wisdom speaks with your mouth, you can't make the excuse that you're ignorant. No. So put it down. Put down your ignorant things. You know better. Then life will begin. Then you'll discover a causeless joy. That doesn't mean that pleasures and joys don't appear. Of course they do, as they do now. They appear and disappear. I said I love to cook and sometimes I burn the food. What to do? Comes and goes. I love to garden. Sometimes I do it right, sometimes I don't. So what? I love the act of gardening. But it's not what lasts. But what lasts informs my gardening. It informs the cooking. It informs everything. It informs lovemaking. This is true lovemaking. When it's informed by the truth of yourself. Not by needing and wanting and chasing and running.
And what can I do to, to stay on this point, you know? Well, first you tell the truth about where you're not willing to, where you think you're going to lose something. As you said earlier, where you said, well, you know, it's like, I don't know, I don't want to give it up, it feels good. That part. So you'd mm. be ruthlessly honest okay. with yourself there. And see, is it serving you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's so clear when you speak with me. Yes. It's so clear. It's so clear because the wisdom is already within you. But you have a good propaganda machine and you are willing to fool yourself with it. So now that has to stop. You know better. Mm. And you know I'm fed up with all this, you know, but but this but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the but is the problem. That's okay. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Very clear. Yeah. It's good to hear you. Thank good. you, too. Good to connect. You, too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Deborah from the U.S. Hi, Eli. Can you hear me? I can. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated your uh, meditation and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm also a social fixation. And um, <clears throat> when you... Um, yeah, your meditation was really medicine when you said um, for the social fixation, no one to relate to. And something you said before that brought up a huge amount of fear, and I just tried to open to it. And then when, um, when I let in no one to relate to, it just felt like this freedom that I had never experienced before. Like all of a sudden, I wasn't like trying to relate to the world around me like I could just be myself and yes. I think you would use the example of like no parents no children no no one that I you know was um, yeah trying to be in relationship with yes. you know and um, but yeah there was just such a huge sense of freedom that came over me and uh, I just wanted to say thank you because actually um, one of my social issues came up last week, and I've really been seeing my my this drive like it's really been rearing its ugly head. And um, yeah, I just really felt the freedom in that moment, like I like I hadn't. So I just want to say thank you for that. I'm so glad, Deborah. That's it. That's the secret. All you need is one instant of that discovery of freedom when you're no. There's no longer any obligation to anyone else. You don't have to be someone's daughter or someone's mother or someone's partner. You don't have to be anything but yourself. All you need is that one instant. And then you stay true to that no matter what. You honor that. You don't go back. You stay true to yourself. That's beautiful. I'm so glad. That's such good news, Deborah. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for the mm. medicine, and yeah, thank you for that mm. meditation. It was deeply relaxing. I'm so glad to know, because it's hard to know just sitting here all in a chair, <laughs> all alone, no one to relate to, no one to tell me if it's good or not. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, Hillary's next from Australia. Oh, um, your your um, meditation it opened something to me um, where I see a relationship that I know I've been grasping at and the freedom of knowing if I just let this go and be whatever it is, even if it doesn't happen or if it does happen, if I just let it be just as it is, I don't feel the suffering. I don't give myself the suffering. Yes. And, and I found a great freedom in that. Good. It, 
it just it opened me so much to just to be myself. Yes. To not not grasp or yes. To not or, grasp for anything. To, to not nothing. To nothing not, at all. Yes. No grasping. My, no grasping. Yes. The, the sexual side, of course, came up for me. The, mm-hmm. the fact of the sitting in the sexualness of it, and and it doesn't seem to matter so much now. It's, yes, of course, it's there. It's like <laughs> you're gardening. <laughs> um, but it's not as strong, and I'm very grateful. Good. I know there's work around it. I accept that. Good. But just the realization, just just that glimpse mm. of knowing I don't have to go into that suffering. Yes. I can just be me and accept me. And if the other being doesn't want to accept me as I am, that has to be all right. Yes. That's beautiful, Hilary. So, just as you... Thank you, Ela. No, I'm so glad. This is so important, grasping, you know? It's like, I don't know if it's true or not, but I know that the, the mythology is that you can catch a monkey by putting something into a jar, and it reaches in and grabs it, and once it has a fist, it can't pull its fist out of the jar, and you catch it. That's this grasping that won't let go. So, we give up our monkey nature for a moment, and we don't grasp anything. When you're open, when there's no grasping, it's all, the whole universe is yours. As soon as you grasp one thing, it all slips between your fingers and it's gone. That's the mystery. If we don't grasp anything, it's all ours. If we grasp anything, it all disappears. That's the nature of Maya. Oh, thank you, Hilary. Grasping, essential. I'm so glad. I'm glad that this was uh, useful. So I recommend that you investigate this for yourself over these coming days. Start to notice what seems like just natural action and see if it's fixated or not. Is it being run by survival? Is it being run by the social drive? Is it being run by your sexual drive? Not to change it, not to fight with it. See, Freud's version is you need a strong morality police to keep guard on it, to keep it it repressed under wraps, under chains. It's not that. It's really making peace with yourself. It's just telling the truth to yourself so that you can meet yourself. So that when these impulses arise, they're not strangers. They're not running without reflection. You're bringing reflective consciousness to the animal. It's beautiful. It's part of our growing up. To put away our childish things. Our childish things are our monkey grasping. Our childish things are our mindless participation. Mindless participation always has a story justifying it. Just overhear yourself. Hear what you're saying to yourself. Hear what you're thinking. And just notice it. And notice, where is its source? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from no mind? Is it coming from love? Is it coming from purity? This is obvious if it is, and it's your nature. Then you love yourself even more deeply. You trust yourself. You can be yourself. And if you overhear yourself and you hear some story, justifying, rationalizing, 
You can laugh at it. It's not bad or wrong, but laugh at it. Laugh at yourself. When we can laugh at ourselves, it's a kind of bliss. If we take ourselves seriously, suffering. So the difference between complete respect for yourself and not taking yourself seriously is the difference between freedom and bondage. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your willingness, for your own inner wisdom that can hear this, make sense of it, and stay true to it. This is we are the same heart, the same love, the same truth. May it spread from heart to heart so that all beings can be free. Thank you.